Up City Volunteers in Cape Town hold a winter aid distribution for the impoverished residents living in the community of Ottery. At the Global City Team Leader Training Seminar, we find out how volunteers help spread the NGO's message back home. Welcome to Da Headlines. I'm Mary Lee. Thank you for joining us. Although the Northern Hemisphere is entering summer, South Africa in the Southern Hemisphere is getting colder as winter arrives, which makes living conditions for the poor even more difficult. Recently, Cape Town City volunteers visited Ottery, a local community, to hold a winter distribution, bringing not only supplies, but a message of compassion. Cape Town is South Africa's second biggest city after Johannesburg, and it is the legislative capital of the country. Its beautiful scenery is known around the world, while landmarks such as Table Mountain are a must-see on many travelers' lists. The June sun in Cape Town is as bright as ever, but the temperature have already drastically fallen. This is the time that city volunteers in South Africa start their winter aid distribution. Despite the cold, everyone is energized to move aid supplies out of the warehouse. 40 of them have 10 packs each, so that's 400 leaf packs. 25 of them have 16 packs, so that's 400 too. Volunteers double-check the amount of relief supplies before traveling to the community of Ottery. Through video clips, Tsuching share with aid recipients the Buddhist NGO's relief efforts around the world. And afterwards, lead everyone in a prayer for peace. During the aid distribution, as volunteers hand over daily necessities and food, words of gratitude are expressed by the recipients. Thank you very much, right? Thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you. Looking after the family in this community like their own, city volunteers hope the aid supplies and rice will help these residents during the cold winter days ahead. Staying in the Southern Hemisphere, Paraguay City volunteers organize winter aid distributions in Ciudad del Este and Asuncion. Meanwhile, Guatemala City volunteers visited the remote area of San Jose, Chacaya, and handed out corrugated iron sheets to 16 families. Traveling through the mountainous area of Solola, Guatemala City volunteers are visiting less fortunate families in San Jose, Chacaya. <laughs> to gain a better understanding of each family's needs, despite the treacherous roads, City volunteers visit residents door to door. During their home visitations, volunteers discover that many families are living in leaky homes. Today, under the witness of the mayor of San Jose, Chacaya, a total of 78 corrugated iron sheets were given to 16 underprivileged families, giving them a chance to live in a safer environment. City volunteers' acts of kindness have also reached those in South America's Paraguay. As winter is just around the corner, city volunteers thoughtfully arrive with relief items. This time, the distribution is held at the Yukiri Elementary School in Santa Lucia, a school that was built by City's Project Hope in 2005. We are very happy to be able to organize a winter aid distribution here today. It has been years since we set foot in this school. The school is still in great condition. During the distribution, a woman shows the volunteers a uniform of the school that her son wore 10 years ago. The woman says she has kept the shirt for years to remind her of Tzu's kindness. Meanwhile, in Asuncion, Tzu's monthly distribution once again brings warmth and hope to impoverished families. With Tzu's relief items in hand, many families now don't have to sleep on empty stomachs. In the years to come, city volunteers will continue spreading their acts of compassion to all corners of the world. Back on this side of the planet, in the Philippines, Ormoc City, city volunteers continue to hold rice distributions, helping impoverished families. During one of city's rice distributions, volunteers met Rumulo Kakikalala, who was going to sell a lizard he had captured. Thankfully, after listening to the volunteer's message of refraining from killing any animals, Kakilala decided to release the lizard back to nature. Touched by the act of kindness, city volunteers gifted the man with an extra bag of rice. <laughs> Despite 
despite the sudden change in weather and city's rice voucher distribution. Local residents listen closely to volunteer Michael Shell's speech on respecting all living beings. Among those on site is Jenny Lin Ulapi, who immediately asked the volunteers to visit her home after the rice voucher distribution. Upon arriving at Ulapi's home, the volunteers discovered that her father, Romulo Kakilala, recently captured a forest monitor lizard and wanted to sell it so the family can purchase rice and pay for their relatives' medical fees. The forest monitor lizard is the larger forgiverous lizard on the planet and is widely eaten by the indigenous people of the Philippines. Although the lizard has already been classified as an endangered species, with its high price on the black market, many continue to capture it for money. Maybe the lizard can sense that the volunteers are here to help him, as it quietly stays in the volunteers' arms. After some persuasion, Romulo Kakilala finally agrees to release the forest monitor lizard back to the wild. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me of the importance of respecting life, or else I would have already killed it. On the day of the rice distribution, city volunteers encouraged Romulo Kakilala to share his encounter with the forest monitor lizard on stage. City volunteers also gave Kakilala an extra bag of rice to show their support for his act of compassion. I want to thank the forest monitor lizard. Thanks to it, my family can have an extra bag of rice. The rice distribution not only aids impoverished families, but also inspires them to have a compassionate heart. Typhoon Haiyan, which swept across parts of the Philippines last November, left countless residents homeless. In Barangay Concepcion of Ormoc City, the government has tried to alleviate the problem with the construction of temporary housings. However, conditions are not ideal, with six people living in a space of 13 square meters. To help residents make the best of these cramped quarters, in February, city volunteers donated folding beds, which helps to save space. Recently, the volunteers paid a visit to the recipients to see how they and their beds were getting along. Across the sea of local government, we see homes. They were left damaged in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan and are now being raised. With their homes gone, many residents have moved into government-constructed housing. Houses flattened by Typhoon Haiyan are still everywhere. In response, the local government has built temporary but safe housing for those left homeless by the typhoon. These homes are only 13 square meters large. Here is their dining table, which also serves as a desk to study at. And just over here is the kitchen. And only a few steps away is the bedroom. Here we see Tsuji's folding beds, which helps residents save precious space. For Ophelia, the folding bed is also her workstation, where she makes handicrafts that will be later sold. Midday, she moves the bed outside to take a nap with her son. In fact, the family often sleeps outside at night. If we didn't have this bed, we would be forced to sleep indoors, which can get really hot. So I'm very thankful to Tsuji for this bed. <laughs> While for single parent Jeffer, the bed serves as his infant's crib. <laughs> While for Concepcion, who runs a small shop selling daily sundries out of her home, the bed is used both day and night. During the day when my shop is open, it serves as a sofa. At night, I fold it out and sleep on it. During this visit, we were very happy to see their accommodations. The homes are safe and comfortable. And of course, we were happy to see that the items we gave them are being used. The community also offers a management office as well as a daycare center. In front of these homes, one now sees cheerful potted plants, a symbol of the hope that residents have embraced as they live behind the tragedy of last year.
For years, the government has been planning to build a new railroad in northeast Taiwan to make traveling to the area easier. And this April, the Taipei Yilan Direct Rail Link was finally shown to the public. Though engineers carefully avoided possible damage to the vital Feitui Dam, the plan still calls for a 21.6-kilometer tunnel that cuts through Snow Mountain. Here's more on the new railroad. Snow Mountain or Xue Shan has enjoyed being guided in silence, but it seems men are fixated on causing another disturbance once again. The tunnel we have in mind is quite long. It will be about 21.6 kilometers in length. 21.6 kilometers is 1.7 times the length of the Xue Shan Tunnel. The newly proposed Taipei Yilan Direct Rail Link includes a tunnel this long that will cut right through Snow Mountain making it the most controversial part of the proposal. According to the Ministry of Transportation and Communications, the weekend passenger volume between Nangang and Toucheng has exceeded current railroad capacity by twofold. The only solution is the new direct link, which is 53 kilometers in length and will feature new tourist stops. Now we have five trains heading to Yilan, Hualien and Taidong, and we plan to add four to five more trains in the future, which will double our capacity. Due to the shorter distances, the travel time will also be reduced. Riding on the Turoku or Puyoma Express, passengers can save up to 18 minutes. Riding on the Zichang Express, which makes fewer stops, they can save up to 38 minutes. However, this means tempering with Mother Nature once again. Though the new railway will sit on the most northern edge of the Snow Mountain Range, it still has to pass through six major faults, six mining areas and 24 tunnels. If the Xuesan Tunnel was 60 on the difficulty scale, then the new railway is around 40, as we have figured out the local geology and can avoid the difficult salon formations. Though some experts believe the project will be easier, but who knows for sure what is hidden underneath the ground? Besides, is this large-scale development really necessary? Wu Shigang, a simple and untamed fishing town, has long been a hidden tourist attraction. It is also where a new train station will be located. If we develop the tourist industry here, we can draw tourists from Metro Taipei and even those from abroad, as coming here will be much easier. The construction will take too long and damage the ecology. The new railway will also increase the price of real estates here. Though some residents oppose the plan, citing damages to the environment, the possible boost to the local economy is nonetheless very tempting. If they are really going to go forward with the project, then when undertaking the environmental impact assessment, they have to be very thorough. They should conduct 10 times the geologic surveys than when digging the Xuesan Tunnel to avoid making the same mistakes. The advent of railways has connected Taiwan cities and towns and helped raise living standards across Taiwan. However, at the same time, the environment has been sacrificed in the process. This time, can people learn to avoid making the same mistakes? We have more coverage on this year's Global City Team Leaders Training Seminar being held at the Tsuji Banchao Grounds. Later, we will meet Tsuji volunteer Lai Li Ying from South Africa, who has been taking on numerous duties on Tsuji's behalf. But first, let's join volunteers from across the world to learn more of their experiences in spreading Tsuji's positive message in their countries. Over the past 20 years, Tsuji's missions in South Africa have seen a dramatic growth. Thanks to Tsuji volunteer Pan Min Shui, the NGO was able to find their way into local communities and has continued to inspire more volunteers to join its cause. We found our way into the poorest African communities. There we saw countless people living in misery. 
We help them to leave their poverty behind and offer them a chance to give. I believe everyone possesses the Buddha nature in their hearts. Finding inner joy through Tsuji's volunteer work, Gladys Ngema is grateful to have had the chance to help the needy for more than 20 years. I'm more happy, but you can see how fat am I, because my heart uh, is free and I'm happy to help other people's life. While Tsuji volunteers from Malaysia share the experiences of their million bodhisattva recruitment campaign in local markets. We must progress vigorously and continuously on the Bodhisattva path. Community members are welcome to join our meetings. On the third date of this year's Global Volunteers Training Seminar, Malaysia and Indonesia volunteers come together to share their experiences with their counterparts from across the globe. After taking the Dharma to heart, I have realized that all troubles are created by ourselves. The experience of the Malaysia volunteers is something worth learning and practicing back home. Thanks to his fellow volunteer support, Zhen Lianmin from Indonesia is able to continue his effort in recruiting new members. It's a test of our wisdom. We need to settle our hearts and continue to recruit new members to join us. We cannot give up. We need to persist. Volunteer from Zimbabwe, who took a 24-hour flight to Taiwan, also seized the chance to share their stories. For example, if I want to hold an aid distribution in Zimbabwe, I need to go through 11 procedures before getting the event permission. All volunteers are working towards the same direction with a common goal. Working for a common goal, Global City volunteers will continue to spread the Buddhist NGO spirit and missions back home. South Africa Tsuji volunteer Lai Li Yin shows video footage of her students' Chinese class. Besides Chinese, Lai also teaches her students Tsuji's humanistic values. When I'm doing volunteer work, I can always leave my aches behind. Only when I return home will I start feeling my aches. When I see their smiles, I feel everything I have done for them has been worthwhile. Lai Ying is not only in charge of home visitations, winter aid distributions and Buddha Day events, but also takes on the tasks of a media volunteer and has learned photography and reporting skills on her own. During the day, I lead local volunteers in volunteer work, while at night I write scripts and edit videos. However, by then I'm usually sleepy. And since I'm an amateur media volunteer, I encounter lots of problems in the process. If I can't finish the work that day, I will leave it there and finish it the next day. Thanks to the Global Volunteer Training Seminar, Lai Li Yin is fully recharged and ready to continue her work back home. Master Zhen Yan continues her tour around the island, and on Tuesday she visited the Jilong and Sanxia Jingsi Halls. Though the Jilong Jingsi Hall is not yet completed, the master hopes the land will become a new spiritual center for local residents. Meanwhile in Sanxia, the master inspected the prefabricated homes going to the Philippines to help Typhoon Haiyan survivors. <laughs> Master Zheng Ying arrives at Sanxia Tsuji Grounds to get an update on the prefabs going to the Philippines. Paying attention to every detail, the master's inspection ranges from the eaves to the structural integrity of the prefabs. At the same time, she expresses her thanks for the nearly 200 volunteers who show up every day to support the cause. Moved by the selfless devotion of her disciples, Master Zheng Yan departs with a peace of mind and heads for Jilong. After nearly three years, the Jilong Jinsi Hall is about 60% completed. 
taking a walk around the build site. The master is concerned about every aspect of the new city grounds, for it will become the new spiritual center of local residents. Taking time to chat with her disciples, the Master is grateful for everyone's hard work and team effort. She reminds them to continue to study the Dharma, to be a positive influence in society. In Myanmar, Stanin Township, city's construction team is working around the clock to build classrooms for 12 schools. Among the building volunteers is Chan Yu, Yu, who was born in Myanmar but later opened a successful business in Taiwan. To offer students in Myanmar a better learning environment, Chan Yu, Yu decided to close his business in Taiwan and return to his native country to give back. Speaking his mother tongue as he double checks the construction progress is 46 year old Chuan Yu, Yu, who was born in Myanmar but left for Taiwan when he was 28. Recently, he has returned to join Tsuji school building project. Coming back to my country to build schools on behalf of these students is a rare opportunity. I can't imagine anything more blessed. So, of course, I agree to join the project. To better devote himself to the building project, Chuan even decided to close his business in Taiwan and return to Myanmar. Myanmar is where I was born and grew up. It's a blessing to help children here with their schooling, and I want to do my part. Chuan Yu not only oversees the construction, but also helps with the sum of the building himself. He says he wants to pass on as many skills as he can to his fellow volunteers. Master Zhenyan is very kind to children here in Myanmar. The Ziji team uses fireproof and waterproof materials, providing our children with a much safer and more comfortable learning environment. Chuan Yu says when he was young, classrooms were built with bamboo and thus exposed to the elements. And he's happy that he can contribute to the building of classrooms that will provide students with a comfortable and dry learning environment. Tsuji Volunteers' mission to spread Jin's aphorisms into local hotels has reached the vacation hotspot of Hualien, Taiwan. The introduction of the calming words of wisdom is a perfect match for Hualien, as it is a spot where many city dwellers visit to relax their mind and spirit. We will leave you with these images. Thank you for watching Da Headlines. Goodbye.